understand the classification of contracts, different contracts. So before we study this, uh, we, we need to know that there are the main heads of the classification and then the, there are going to be subheads. For example, we'll start with this uh, classification. Main classification is the classification according to enforceability. This is the main head. Then under this classification, we have these types these five types. Then we will have another uh, main classification, which is according to the formation. This is the main head, and these three are parts of this uh, main head. And then we are going to have our, uh, another head, which will be known as according to performance, and then according to number of parties involved. So there are uh, some main headings and then there are then subheadings in each main heading so let's start with this uh, according to enforceability now what is the enforceability and how do we classify the contracts uh, within this enforceability is enforceability is that if a contract is enforceable by law or by the court for example if you're going to take a contract and you're going to claim that the other party did not fulfill its promises and you want the court to resolve your matter, the court is first going to look at the enforceability part. That if your contract is enforceable by law or it is not enforceable by law. So, as we've already studied the essentials of a valid contract. So the only contract which is going to be straightforwardly enforceable by law will be a valid contract. That is its first kind. Then we have the void contract. Then we have the voidable contract, unenforceable contract, illegal agreements. So all these are the classification based on enforceability. Now let's start with the first one. A valid contract, as we already know, that if it fulfills all of its essentials, it is a valid contract, which means that it has no flaw, it is completely fine, and it fulfills all of its essentials, starting from the <clears throat> offer and acceptance, free consent, genuine consent, capacity of parties, legal formalities. If it meets all of its requirements, it is a valid contract and it will be enforceable by law without any hesitation by the court. This is the first type. The second type is the void contract now this is a little tricky to understand void contract is a contract which ceases to be enforceable by law which means that at some point this means that a void contract is not void from the beginning it was a valid contract in the beginning but because of certain reasons it became void. So it is a valid contract because of certain reasons. When it becomes void, it is no more enforceable by law. Then we call it a void agreement or a void contract. Now, how is this possible? For example, if you look at this uh, first example, A agrees to sell his house to B in five days. Now, two parties, they have a contract that a person A is going to sell his house to B in five days. There are still five days for the execution of this contract. But the house is burned on the third day. The third day, the house is burned. That means now A cannot fulfill its promise 
as it was promised in the contract. Therefore, it will become impossible for A to fulfill its contractual promises. So this way, the contract which was a legal contract, which was a valid contract, which was enforceable by law, initially, it became unenforceable by law or it became a void contract because of this impossibility of performance. The same way, if you get a letter from a university, for example, which says that you will have to pay your uh, fee by 23rd October 2020. If you do that, you will get the admission. For example, if you can't do it, this means that the contract will be considered as void contract. It will be valid till 23rd October 2020. But after that, it will become a void contract. So this means it was a valid contract at one point, but now because of certain reasons, it became void. So valid and void. The third type is the voidable contract. Now this is again more clear to understand, but not very difficult. Now, what's the definition? If a contract is enforceable by law, enforceable by law, the option of one party, but not on the other party, then it is it will be known as a voidable contract, which means. For example, a contract was done based on uh, coercion or undue influence that somebody pointed a gun towards one party and they, the two parties entered into a contract. Now, th when that contract is going to go to the court, for example, the coercion happened with person A. Person A was not having free consent or a genuine consent, but somehow the agreement took place and it involves A and B. In our case, A is the victim. A doesn't have a free or a genuine consent. So this kind of contract, when it, it, it is going to go to the court, the court is going to ask person A, if he or she wants, he or she can declare the contract as a valid contract or this person A has the capacity to make it void, voidable. So if a contract is enforceable by law at the option of one party, but not on the option of other party, it is known as a voidable contract. For example, A sells his car to B under undue influence, maybe because of his father or mother or some relative or somebody, but the contract is done. Now, B has the option to void the contract or not. Now, B has the option to continue with the contract or B also has this option that he can cancel the contract. Then we have this uh, other example. A painter agrees to paint a house of a person, A. Painter and A, they have made a spoken contract, for example. The person A afterwards prevents the painter to paint. The contract it vo is voidable at the option of the painter. Now, if the painter wants, he can have this uh, contract as a valid contract, or if he wants, he can have this contract as the uh, avoid contract. So these are known as voidable contracts, which are enforceable by law at the option of one party. Another type is unenforceable contract. This happens because of some technical issue or technical fault in the contract for example for example uh, there was a contract which was written on a 
piece of paper or which was written on a stamp paper. Somehow that stamp paper is left in your pocket and uh, your clothes are washed. Now there's no ink, the, uh, the terms and conditions are all erased and there are no signs and there are no thumb impressions. So this way, it has some technical fault because the court cannot read the terms and conditions and the signatures and the thumb impressions. That is why now it becomes an unenforceable contract and it cannot be enforced by law. Another example can be that a contract was required to be done on a 100 rupees stamp paper. But it was done on a 10 rupees stamp paper. We'll talk about this at some other time that how do we calculate uh, how much uh, uh, amount of stamp paper do we need to write. But if this mistake was done, the contract will become unenforceable. It will not be enforced by the law. So because of some technical fault, if the contract is not enforceable by law, it becomes an unenforceable contract. And the last is the illegal agreement. Now, we make some contracts which, in which the agreement is illegal. For example, they are forbidden by your country's law. So they will become illegal agreements. Now, A gives money to B for the business of smuggle goods and share profit. Sharing profit is fine. You do that in partnership and other businesses. But doing smuggled, uh, doing a business of smuggled goods is forbidden by law. So this makes this whole contract as an illegal agreement. So these were the types of the contracts based on enforceability. Now the second type, the main type is according to the formation. That how do you form a contract? In which we have these three categories, express contracts, implied contracts, quasi-contracts. As you can very clearly see with the words, for example, express contract. Express contract means that a contract in which the terms and conditions of the agreement are fully and explicitly stated orally or in writing. For example, when you were making a contract, both the parties made the terms and conditions very, very clear to each other in a written form or verbally. The details were discussed, the questions were asked, and all the clarity was uh, given to each other. So if you do a contract in which you are being very clear to each other, you are telling the terms and conditions in writing or orally to the other person and the other person is also telling you the terms and conditions. In terms of formation, it will be known as an express contract. Then implied contract. Implied contract is formed in a whole or in parts by a conduct as opposed to the words. Now you don't say things, you don't write things, but your conduct are the reasons which are making you and the other person feel that you are entering into a contract. For example, if you went to a restaurant and you order a cup of tea or you have a cup of tea, it is an implied contract that you are going to pay the amount of cup of tea to the restaurant people. Now, when you go to a restaurant, you don't ask them and you don't tell them that you will be paying them uh, the amount of uh, money against the food that you're going to eat. And the same way, they don't ask you if you have some money before ordering the food. It is understood that both the parties will uh, go according to the terms and conditions. And as human beings, we actually growing with these implied contracts. It doesn't have any expression or any uh, words or 
anything in written form but you're very clear about it that you have to pay the amount of money in a restaurant the third type is even more uh, you can say a complicated or something quasi contracts implied in law now some people call it moral obligations but they are actually legal obligations for example a fictional contract imposed on parties by the court in the interest of fairness and justice typically to prevent unjust enrichment of one party at the expense of the other party now read this example it has some flaw but just to make it clear if a found gold of b it is not b's responsibility i have did it deliberately it is a's responsibility to give back gold to b the same way if b leaves the goods at a's home by mistake a uses the goods without the permission of b now a is bound to give b the payment of goods or the usage usually we talk about this phrase of finder's keeper that is not true if you you found something it is your legal responsibility to give it back to uh the the person to whom it belongs so these are known as quasi contracts then there is another classification based on number of parties and based on the performance now performance means fulfilling a promise made in the contract for example one supplier agreed that he is going to deliver 100 air conditioners to the retailer the retailer agreed that he is going to give the supplier say 100000 rupees now supplying the air conditioner is performance expected from the supplier giving 100000 rupees to the supplier is the expected performance from the retailer now in 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 this condition we have two types executed contracts and executory contracts executed means that all fully performed by all parties if it is fully performed by all parties it will be known as the executed uh contract which means that both the parties have fulfilled the promises they made to each other executed for example 100 air conditioners are supplied to the retailer 100000 rupees is given to the supplier if both have done everything which was promised in the contract it will be known, known as executed contract but suppose if partially or fully by one or both the parties partially and fully by one or both the parties if performance is left it is not yet fully performed it will be known as the executory contract it will be known as the executory contract so executed and executory then we have this last type which is known as unilateral versus bilateral uni means one by means two so we already know that in a contract we must have two parties but what happen sometimes is that in bilateral contract both the parties are known but in uni unilateral contract one party is known the other party is not known for example if i make a promise with person x y z and we uh, 
talk about terms and conditions and everything i am also known the xyz person is also known so both are known at the time of the contract at the time of the contract but sometimes if both are known then it is bilateral but sometimes there is a condition when one party is known but the other party is not known for example a promise to pay 1000 to anyone who finds his or her bag now in this case one party is known which is a but the other party is not known at the time of the contract other party is who who can be this party whoever is going to find the bag so this is how we uh, classify our contracts based on number of parties involved sometimes two parties are involved sometimes one party both part two parties are involved but sometimes two parties are known at the time of the contract 